Hi, everybody. Um, good morning here still from El Salvador. Um, I think the veggie trucks have stopped going by my house right now. So hopefully we won't have that many interruptions. Um, I'm really excited to share with you all some of the results and experiences from last summer. Um, the limited study that I was able to carry out with the support of the Center for Human Rights and International Justice and the Rennebaum family serves as a bridge between two projects. So it's a kind of update to my master's thesis from the UCA in San Salvador about sacraments in ecclesial-based communities and a kind of diagnostic study for my current dissertation research on the non-normative liturgical practices of ecclesial communities who celebrate without a priest. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and admit upfront that the limitations were considerable. Uh, because of COVID and wanting to take everybody's safety into account, I was unable to include an in-person visit in this study. Um, and even the virtual tools that I suggested in my proposal resulted less useful than I had hoped. My intent was to conduct something akin to participatory observation at community liturgies through video calls. And while applying to do research, I was confident that this would be a useful substitute for in-person visits. Um, during lockdown, students had studied virtually. Many workplaces used video calls to host meetings and virtual co-working spaces. And significantly, many of the communities that participated in this project used video calls to worship virtually. However, El Salvador's public schools reopened on April 6, 2021, and vaccination rates increased dramatically in that same month. That's great news. Um, but these factors, together with the gradual return of most workers to in-person work, the reopening of public transportation, um, these contributed to a return to many in-person events. So by the time of my research between July and August 2021, many communities had returned to in-person worship. In most cases, this made virtual participation at liturgies infeasible for me because many communities meeting spaces do not have internet signal for virtual broadcasting and participation, especially in rural areas. Um, nevertheless, I was able to make contact with several communities and schedule meetings with individual members or with groups gathered in a member's home in order, <clears throat> excuse me, to hear their own descriptions of their community celebrations and to talk about their social political reality and, <clears throat> and ecclesial praxis or discipleship outside of worship. They were also able to provide me with photos of their worship spaces and celebrations via WhatsApp. So these connections facilitated by my own longstanding personal and professional relationships and ongoing dialogue and theological reflection with many of these communities resulted in at least a few fruitful insights and signposts for my current study. All right, so um, yeah, today I'm gonna present some of the content of these meetings and communication and some of the backward, background information that's led to to this um, study. Okay, great. So um, first, a brief overview of the field. El Salvador is located, as you all probably know, in the middle of the Central American Isthmus. It's about the size of Massachusetts. Approximately one third of the world's Salvadoran population lives outside of El Salvador as a result of first, the Salvadoran Civil War, which lasted from 1980 to 1992. And today, major push factors for migration, including poverty, social violence, and family reunification. The current president, Nayib Bukele, was elected in 2019 with overwhelming popular support in El Salvador and among Salvadorans living abroad. But many have begun to question or withdraw their support over the last year or so because of the administration's undemocratic and authoritarian policies. Before my study last summer on May 1st, 2021, International Workers' Day, the Salvadoran Armed Forces occupied the Legislative Assembly in what human rights organizations call a technical coup d'etat, ousting five members of the constitutional bench of the Supreme Court and replacing them with justices loyal to the president, cementing his control of all three branches of government. Dur directly after my study on September 15th, Independence Day, thousands of people took to the streets to denounce Bukele's government takeover, adoption of Bitcoin as a national currency, and the increasing militarization of Salvadoran society in the first of now several massive demonstrations against the administration and its policies. This political context is important to understand in a study of community liturgies and their relevance to people's daily lives. Uh, these are the communities or networks of communities I was able to contact for my study last summer. 
I have not listed the names of the communities here per my IRB requirements, um, but I have noted going forward that many communities expressed wanting to be named in this research. They want to be able to claim the stories and perspectives that they share. And I'm taking this into account as I prepare for a second phase of my current work. A brief word about ecclesial based communities. Um, from an ecclesiastical point of view, from the church's point of view, SEBS, as they're called by their initials in Spanish, can be a subdivision of a parish, a sort, sort of Bible study group of families that seeks to apply the gospel to their daily lived reality. The Latin American bishops in their 1968 meeting in Medellin, Colombia, called the SEBS the, quote, first and fundamental ecclesial nucleus, so not the parish and not families, which is what we usually hear. Um, though this appreciation deteriorated significantly during the papacy of John Paul II. Historically, the SEBS grew out of a socio-religious process of ecclesial experiences and paradigm shifts in pastoral formation that resulted in the articulation of liberation theology. These small communities read the Bible together, discovered that the message of Jesus and the Gospels is one of resisting imperial power and denouncing God's hope for life for all creation. And they became active in the social and political struggles of their time out of a place of faith. So today, many SEBs exist and continue to come about outside of the parish structure because of significant ecclesiological and theological differences between ecclesial authorities and the SEBs. Literature about contemporary SEBs in English is quite scarce, uh, but they continue to be a significant element of the Latin American church. In El Salvador, the SEBs formed a national network of communities in 2008, and since that time have met monthly and participated in regional and continental SEBS meetings. I'm interested in SEBS liturgies because since the 1980s, scholars have noticed a gap between groups of socially active Christians who are, in, who are involved in progressive struggles for justice and equality, and what I'll call liturgically active Christians who are committed to the correct implementation of liturgical rubrics as a central activity of ecclesial life. The problem with this gap is that it does not reflect a core element of contemporary liturgical theology, namely that liturgy is supposed to function as the source and summit of ecclesial life, a space where Christians can meet to draw strength as a community and be renewed in their commitment to act as followers of Jesus in their daily life. As uh, Spanish theologian Jose Maria Castillo says here, if there are people who do not consider worship to be the most preeminent and effective task that the church may carry out in order to humanize our society and in order to reduce suffering in this world, then in this we have the clearest proof that Christian worship is not being celebrated how God commands and orders it. Precisely because we want to be more radical and more effective in our liberating service to humanity, that's why we should be more demanding in our fidelity to Christian worship. That is, if Christian liturgy is not contributing to a humanizing praxis of churchgoers in the world. It is neither Christian nor liturgy. Alternatively, if Christian praxis is not motivated out of the ritual remembrance of Christ's passion, participation in the church's sacramental life, and an act of hope of the eschaton, it cannot be said to be distinctively Christian, and the risk of falling into political ideology looms ever greater. Both Castillo and Leonardo Bo suspect that some sort of ritual or symbolic failure is behind this liturgical crisis. Boff describes this as ritual mummification and advocates for updating liturgical rites and symbols to be meaningful to contemporary Christians. Castillo speaks of symbolic dysfunction and adds that blaming the liturgical crisis on a lack of proper catechetical formation is a scapegoating mechanism that does not address the true problem of signification and enculturation. I tend to agree with the analysis of Bach and Castillo, and my current research is oriented to understanding the non-normative symbols and rites that ecclesial communities propose and use today to inform their Christian life and praxis outside of liturgy. Basically, my research last summer suggested that communities continue to celebrate liturgy in creative and innovative ways that do not always conform to the normative rubrics of the Catholic Church, and especially supported the hypothesis that these liturgical practices inform and motivate their involvement as people of faith in the social and political struggles of their context. So non-normative liturgies, liturgies that don't conform to Catholic rubrics, are more truly living out the church's normative teaching about liturgy, helping close this gap between liturgical participation and social discipleship among the subs in El Salvador. 
So here I list nine liturgical elements that I used as a baseline for starting to ask communities about their liturgical celebrations. Though communities understand these categories differently, do not always incorporate all nine elements and also shared additional elements. For now, I wanna share a little bit about how, about the altars that communities use in worship and about some of their liturgical music. The pictures that I will share in the next several slides were sent to me by a community in Morasan in the Eastern mountains uh, bordering Honduras that identifies strongly with their indigenous Kakawira heritage. This particular celebration was a Thanksgiving liturgy for the community's first university graduate pictured here. And the altar you see in the foreground of the picture is pretty typical of this community's liturgies. The colors of the flowers around the outside correspond to the colors of a traditional Maya altar, and the fruits on the altar cloth represent the fruits in season at the time. The altar's on the ground, not on a table, uh, and is rebuilt anew for every liturgy. In fact, the altar is built as the liturgy occurs, especially during the offering, which we'll see in the next several photos. The offertory is usually a time in a Catholic mass where tithes are collected from the congregation and the Eucharistic bread and wine are brought to the altar. Here, the community added several more elements to their offertory, which I'll go through now. The first is water. Um, all of the elements were brought up by children, um, cousins, daughters, and siblings of the university graduate. Um, the first four are correspond to the elements and these are pretty standard in the, in the celebrations of this community. So here we have water, air. Air is my favorite one. It's an inflated plastic bag, usually with a little stone in it to keep it weighed down. Earth, dirt gathered from the community's land. And then fire, also called light. It's a candle um, and usually the the blessing around this element talks about how the word of God illuminates our daily lives. An image of Saint Oscar Romero. Um, you can see one uh, banner on the wall of the chapel behind you. There's at least two others in the worship space. Um, and this community called itself Saint Romero before Romero was canonized. So they've, um, they have a history of being pretty dedicated to him. The Biblia Latinoamericana, not a great image, but this is a translation of the Bible made specifically for um, popular grassroots Bible study. And then the university degree of the student herself. Um, so these are the community's first fruits. This altar and these offerings are interesting because progressive liturgical theology, especially academically, uh, usually tries to emphasize and recover the meal aspect of liturgy as contrasted to the sacrificial aspect, but that's not necessarily true in these communities. They retain a strong sense of the sacrifice required to live as a follower of Jesus, to struggle for the life of the community, both in daily agricultural work and in political participation. And they certainly here recognize the sacrifice of this young woman in earning her university degree. However, the meal aspect is not lost either. Many of the items on the altar represent the daily foods of the communities, even corresponding to the season. So the sense that this celebration is a meal and a participation in Christ's sacrifice is not lost or seen as dual or separate, which is often the tension that we find in North American Catholic communities. The second aspect quickly um, are selections from two of the songs that this community in the Bajo Lempa region used at an ordinary Sunday liturgy. Um, the first, the entrance song, has become the title to my dissertation, Que esta misa nos haga soñar. May this mass or liturgical celebration allow us to dream of a better kind of world, of a different relationship to the land, to each other, and significantly of a different kind of church, of otra iglesia posible. This song directly connects liturgy to discipleship in the world and in the church, and it is a commonly used song in community liturgies. The second and final song is used during the distribution of bread and wine that this community consecrates and shares Eucharistically. And I'm particularly interested in the Eucharistic moments of these community liturgies, one, because this is one of the liturgical elements most centrally controlled by normative Catholic teaching, and two, because this is a liturgical element that most communities won't, wouldn't celebrate without a priest during the first and second generation of subs. So here the community sings, quote, Jesus is this bread of equality. We come to receive or commune or part partake with the struggles of those peoples who seek justice and dignity, end quote. 
They affirm Catholic teaching that Jesus truly becomes present in the Eucharistic materials and connect reception of these consecrated elements with becoming like Jesus and struggling for equality, justice, and dignity in society. For this community and for others who sing the song, to receive Eucharist is to become a danger to the status quo, to discomfort, and to yearn for God's reign. So by way of conclusion, um, the study has been extremely gener generative for me in preparing to write my dissertation on these practices in collaboration with Sebs and El Salvador. Right now I'm completing a first stage of in-person participatory observation in these and other communities and networks. And in June, I plan to begin facilitating focus group sessions and a small participatory photography element with young people from these communities. So I'm very grateful for the center's support and look forward to sharing more about decolonial and constructive elements of these communities, liturgical theology and praxis as time goes on. Thank you very much.